Well, welcome everybody to Gluten-Free Baking with Dr. Ted. <laughs> no, not really. I'm just, I'm just kidding. That's, that's my attempt to open with a joke. Uh, tonight is, yeah, I got a thumbs down on that joke. Tonight is Law of Attraction is Told Through the Scriptures. And this class really was born from feedback I was getting from people as we were doing class. Not so much me seeking this out. I kind of feel like it found me. So I dug into it. I tried to find people that knew more about it than I did and just picked their brain and asked them. A common thing that happened for me in doing these classes about law of attraction, people would come up and say, hey, that thing that you said, that's in the Bible. And I'd say, really, it is? And they'd say, yeah, it's right here. And I'd say, cool, let's look at it. And I never really, I don't claim to be a Bible scholar, to have studied the Bible by any means at all. My, my history with the church is not one that we walked parallel paths for a long time. So I'm not going to get into all of that tonight. Before we start here, just give me a show of hands. How many of you have seen the movie The Secret or, or read the book? Read the book, seen the movie? Okay, cool. All of you. Good. All right. I'm preaching to the choir. It just gives me an idea of where we'll, where we'll begin and where we'll start. Did you raise your hand? Okay, yeah, everyone, everybody. Okay, how many of you heard of the Bible? Okay, I'll just check in. We won't start there. He says, I've heard of it before. Well, before I jump into it, I just want to tell you a little bit about myself and my sort of history. Would that be okay if I just take a minute or so to do that? As I said, my name is Dr. Ted Mortar IV. So I'm one of 14 doctors in my family. I'm the first of the third generation, and I've worked closely with my family for the last 15 years in focusing on a mind and body approach that puts the responsibility back on the person. It says you are responsible for your life. It is, in essence, the choices that you make that lead to your health, and that led me down the path to be here today to talk to you guys about our subject because I'm going to tell you the same thing that makes you healthy is the same thing that makes you happy. It's the same thing that brings you joy. It's the same thing that makes you successful in your business and in your life. It's the same thing that brings you healthy relationships. It's all the same. It's all a common denominator. So I've had the opportunity to work with my family in kind of clinical setting, in patient care for a long time, and I've seen a lot of wild things happen. I've literally helped thousands of people get rid of emotional, physical pain using the things that I'm going to share with you tonight. You guys said you've seen The Secret. So there's a guy in that movie named Reverend Michael Beckwith. You guys remember him in the movie? So I've personally gotten to work with this guy. I've had him on my table. He and his wife, Ricky. Both of them got them on the table, and I had the opportunity to, to treat them and to work with them because they appreciate and understand the value of what it is that we do when we get on the table. Lisa Nichols is in that movie. I've had her on my table before. had the opportunity to work with her. Lisa Nichols, author, you know, law of attraction guru, or whatever her title is. Just dynamo. That's probably a good one for her. She's just awesome to be around. She's just infectious. So if you go to my website, which is mortarwellness.com, you can look at some pretty glowing testimonials. There's a video testimonial there from Michael Beckwith talking about the mortar family and what the mortars do. Uh, there's a great testimonial from Jack Canfield, the guy who wrote Chicken Soup for the Soul. If you guys haven't seen that, just go watch it. It's like 30 seconds long. Uh, another one by Wayne Dyer. So I don't... I'm sure we're preaching to the choir. You know who these people are. And I, and I don't want to toot my horn. I just want to show you a little glimpse of what my family has created over the last 45 years and what I've been a part of since day one, since I chose this family and came here and showed up on the scene to, have, to get ready to party. Let the party begin. I've personally taught over 200 classes 
in the last two years here in Northwest Arkansas on this right here, on the law of attraction. This is class number 212. And in doing those classes, I, I ran into a problem, and it kept coming up, which is the birth of this class tonight. And the best way for me to explain or to convey what the challenge was that I ran up against is in a story, and I want to share a story with you. Is that cool if I do that? Yeah? Okay, yeah. You have to move your, move your head or something. Uh, this is a true story, 100% true, not mostly true, not almost all the way true. This actually happened to me in a clinic just a mile or so down the road, here, right there on Rainbow Curve. I had a woman bring me her daughter. Her daughter's 18 years old. She was an adult by all standards. But she brought me the daughter because her daughter was broken and needed to be fixed. She needed me to fix her. She needed me to fix her head. Because what the daughter was doing was dating an older man. And the mother did not like that. So here she was about to go off to school, and she's dating this older guy. And he's black. She's dating an older black man. And this is just a really big problem for the mother. The daughter, for all intents and purposes, she had it together. She had it going on. This, this girl had her stuff, her ducks in a row, if you will, ready to go to college. Ready to, she was still living at home, though. So her mother was very, very concerned that she was not behaving. The daughter was not behaving in accordance to the mother's beliefs. So here's what I see what happens in practice. People bring kids to me. They bring the children. The children really are just a reflection of the parents. What's going on with the kids is a mirror of the neuroses of the parent. And I promise you, are you, is, is this father, son? I saw, the, I saw the eye right there. Now I understand all my problems. Yes, yeah, see, so it's not your fault. It's your parents' fault, right? Yeah. <laughs> that turned around on you real quick, didn't it? But, but there is no perfect parent. There is no perfect family. That's why there's no annual convention for the adult children of normal parents, right? There's, there are no normal parents. It doesn't exist. It's all this part of life, this game that we play as we're all learning here together. So I knew I had to have the mother on board, and I had to work with the mother because she was just, boom, she was that way out there. She brought me photocopies of the girl's personal journal, yeah, there's your sign. I should have seen it coming. She brought me records of her phone history, her text messages, printouts of the text between her, an adult, and this man she was in a relationship with, also an adult. And I never even looked at that crap. I Honestly, I did not because I didn't want to be invested in it. I didn't want to have an opinion and to put or project my beliefs about whether what she was doing was right or wrong. Because ultimately, what happens when you get on the table and the treatment is about removing the interference between you and the power that built you. That's all. And the less I know about your situation, the more objective I can be about it. So I didn't want to know all that stuff. But she sure wanted me to know it all. I'm sharing this with you because I knew mom had to be on board. So I got them both. They're in here. I said, you got to do it too, Mom. She said, okay, I'm ready to sacrifice to help my daughter. I'm going to bear this burden. So I get them both in here. The, the daughter's fine. The daughter gets great results. I mean, she's awesome. She's 18 years old. The mother begins to make incredible strides. I see her for two weeks. I see her for three weeks. And I'm telling her, I'm just giving it to her. I'm like right there with her. I'm passionate about what I do. I know how it works because I've seen it happen time and time again. And I understand the hope that's here for this person. And I'm sharing with her. And I'm talking and I'm teaching. I'm telling her all about the power of her mind and how she influences, how her intention guides the expression of her life. That she has the ability to help create her life. And then here's what happened. I think that 
this is my opinion I'm going to insert here. I think that she got in touch with a part of herself that was real and it scared the hell out of her. And in that moment, she closed down and she defended against everything that I was saying or doing. And she did it with a vengeance. She came at me with the wrath of a tiger mom. She laid it on me. And it was her defending in a stance, her defending the beliefs that she held about her church. Because she felt what I was saying was contradicting her core values and principles about her faith. So, you know, I'm, I'm cool. I can dig on that. If, you don't, if this isn't for you, then that's great. I'm not here to try to convert everybody. You're allowed to believe what you want. I'm cool with that. But I walked into my office, and there's a stack of papers, you know, maybe an inch and a half thick of just crap that she had printed off of the Internet at home. She printed all this stuff to show me how wrong I was and what the right way was. And all of a sudden, I felt like I was her daughter, like I wasn't acting under the umbrella of her beliefs, and so I was wrong, and she was coming at me. Isn't it funny how there's a theme with people that everyone else is wrong, and they have to run around and try to fix everybody? Yeah, I'm sure none of you are like that, but you know somebody like that, right? It's not you. She even did this. She went to my business partners behind my back, and tried to get them to turn against me and to get me kicked out of the clinic. She told them that I, this is kind of comical, that I tried to get her to join the Church of Scientology. I have no idea where that came from, nor do I really need to understand it. But there's a reason that I'm telling you this story. Because when I came in and I got that stack of papers. I read the first few and I threw it in the trash. She must have spent 50 bucks on printer. It was real pretty, real pretty stuff, laser printer. Like I know what that stuff costs. Just in the garbage. Go in to get the people that were close to me to try to turn on me. Sending me nasty emails. Threatening emails. I felt really alone. I felt like I had a message, like this was powerful. This transforms people. And I'm here wide open. My heart is open. I'm here to share with this woman. And she, well, she just, she got defensive. We'll just, we'll leave it at that. And it hurt. I felt powerless and I felt alone. Like here I am with this message to share. Somehow I ended up in Bible Belt, USA. There must be a reason why. And then I begin to doubt. I begin to doubt myself. Am I really doing the right thing? What if she's right? Have you guys ever felt like that? I felt like maybe I'm just crazy. Maybe I need medication or something. Maybe I'm just psychotic. I felt that way. I felt powerless and I felt rejected. I'm going to ask you, to remember a time in your life that you felt that way. When's a time that you try to go share the law of attraction with someone in your family? Yeah, how, how well was that received? For most of us, not really. And we felt rejected. How many times have you felt alone? Like you're the only one that gets it? No one else gets it? Are you serious? This seems so obvious. You don't, you don't get it? I know you've felt that way. I know you have. Because we all have the same story. The characters are different. The timing is all different. But the emotions are the same. And we can all relate to feeling that way. So what I want to do for you is I want to help begin to lead you on a transformation so that you can talk to people, specifically these people, that you, that have, you have met with such fierce resistance. Hello. Hello. I am so sorry. I got lost. You're not sorry. You're awesome. What are you <laughs> talking about? 
I gotta lock all the doors around here. You guys. Welcome. Thank you. Hey, nice book. I just finished it. Love it. Love that book. One of my favorites. Magic of Believing. What I was saying is that even though we're all different and we're at different points and phases on our journey, it's the same story. The emotions are the same for all of us. And I want you to relate to that. I want you to understand how that feels. I want you to remember that. Because what we're going to do is we're going to learn how to have the certainty so that we can inspire people. We're going to learn to, in essence, meet them where they are so we can use their words to help them. In the same way that somebody else helped us just using different words. Maybe we resonated with these words or those words or this or that. Maybe that spoke to us in a certain way. Come on in, guys. You can sneak around the back. Hi. I want to be able to help you speak to the people that you meet with resistance. What I don't want is for you to shut down because of those experiences that have happened in your life, because of the negative stuff. Don't shut down, okay? Don't feel like you're crazy and you're saying the wrong thing. I mean, I've been there. I'll tell you this, too. That is when your character is built. That is when you're forged. The steel is forged in the fire. This is where you really decide what you believe. This is where you become who you are and you develop your character. True leaders make quick decisions based on their core values and their characters. They're not influenced by all of the opinions of everyone around them. Yeah, they still listen to people and take counsel, but they have the ability to look inward. And this is what the Bible teaches us to do. Are you guys with me so far? I haven't fun yet. I'm starting to get warmed up starting to get there I want you not only to be able to have the certainty that you need so that you don't feel wishy-washy when you are talking to somebody and and keying in all of the old programming about the times when you tried to talk to someone before and they shut you down and then you relive that negative emotion and you play out that negative experience that's stored in the subconscious memory This is about you liberating yourself from that. So as you go down this path, you not only have the certainty so that you can go and inspire people and bring them into a moment of inspiration or being in spirit or in the presence, but you yourself have to align yourself with the spirit and with the word of God to be able to communicate and share these things with certainty so that you can stand there and have words filled with faith that impact people. I'm getting warmed up now. Amen. Amen. (laughs) So that's where we're going tonight. If that's what you want to do, then you're in the right place. I know we're kind of speaking to like-minded people, so what we're going to do tonight is I'm going to go deep dish on one area. I'm going to go Chicago style on you. And then I'm going to sort of gloss over some other things. But the other things, I'm going to give them to you, okay? I'm going to give you a handout so that you can take that stuff with you. And in the time that we have today, I'm going to go through as much as I can. And then I'm going to tell you how you can take it further. And then I'm going to give you the stuff so that you can choose whether you want to do it with us or do it on your own. It's totally cool. But I want you to have the tools. And every one of the scriptures that I'm going to use tonight, they're on the handout. So I'll say them as I'm reading them, and then I'm going to give you a handout with them at the end. Okay? So don't worry. Or be like, Whoa, which one was that? What was that? Don't freak out. They're all going to be there. All right, so here we go. The... The big point that I'm going to end on, so I'm just going to start with it. I'll tell you what I'm going to tell you, and then I'll tell you, and then I'll tell you what I just told you. And the point is this. 
that when the word of God is in our heart, in our spirit, and transformed by the tongue and spoken through our word, out of our mouth, we release a powerful spiritual force that releases the ability of God within us. That's it. When we have the word in our heart, when it is a part of us, we speak that word, we use those faith-filled words, and through our tongue we transform the spirit and we release through a spiritual law, it's a spiritual force that we release through our spoken word and really what it does is it releases the ability of God within us so that God has the opportunity to work through us. I want you to know that God is in, if God is omnipotent and everywhere and all-knowing and ever-present and always is, was, and always will be, then there's nowhere that God isn't. So God is in my shoe and God is in the leather in my shoe. That God is inside of us. That God was there in our development in the mother's womb. And and the original design guided the expression of that life so that this baby here in the back of the room can be here. It's no human that did that. I promise you. We'd screw it up. I know that. That force did not abandon you the day you were born. It is intact inside of you 100% right now. And your job is to learn how to use your mind, your heart, and your words so that you align yourself with the Word of God so that it can release itself from within you. Cool? All right, so that's what I'm going to tell you. So let's get into it. The first scripture is Pete, Paul. Peter, Paul, John, Paul. Can't keep them all straight. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Paul didn't say this because he believed in his ability. Paul had received the Spirit into his heart. He spoke from the abundance overflowing out of his heart. It was the ability of God within him that gave him the strength to do anything. I can do anything through Christ which strengthens me. It's not because I I wouldn't say, if Paul did not say that because he thought he was so awesome, he could do everything. Paul said that because he knew that he had in his heart the spirit and could use the word And so all things that strengthen me, I'm going to screw it up. I can do all things through Christ which strengthen me. Was about what was overflowing out of his heart. So let's go deeper into it. John, verse 1, chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. The Word was God, and the beginning was the Word. Here's just a fun thing to consider, too. God said, let there be light, and there was. That means that everything in our physical world came from some unseen, unspoken, undescribable vibration. Because isn't Word a vibration? Isn't light a vibration? Just something to consider. We're not going to get into that tonight. Just a little nugget for you. So it was. The word is where it began. And I like this guy, Henry Ford. I mean, I don't know him, but not that you know. I mean, he's not alive anymore, but we hang out. Henry Ford was coined for saying this. If you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. And it is our thinking that makes it so. And your thoughts and the words that you form from those thoughts are so very important that you're mindful of them. you got to be on alert of what comes out of your mouth. Because your words can put you over the top 
or they can hold you in bondage, right? That if you speak something, it here's the, here's the rub. There's no neutral thought. So every thought you have is either health-producing or disease-enhancing. It's either helping you towards your goal and lining you up with the Spirit or building more and more interference and distance or dissonance or dis-ease between you and the source. That's all. You have no protection from your thoughts either. Just the same way that you surely will take a bite of food. You get to pick what you want to eat, right? I'm going to pick up and eat that. I'm in the mood for this one over here. But as soon as you chew that up and swallow, you have no control over what happens. And the same is true of your thoughts. You have no control after you have the thought, how your body reacts and responds to it, how your environment reacts and responds to it, and how God shows up in your life. We're going to get to that. So make sure that you are aren't speaking the words of the problem. I see people, and since we're using the Bible, I'm going to just limit to Christians, but I don't really care what your faith or belief or church or religion or whatever your dogma is. People they say one thing on Sunday and say another thing on Monday, that they pray to the problem. They pray defeat. And so guess what? They pray to the problem and it gets worse. They pray to the defeat and then they lose. So if it's not something that you want, then don't pray it and don't say it. Don't put your focus on it. Don't put your focus on it. That the things that you view in your life as your problems, you don't have to fix them. You just have to stop focusing on them all the time. And you have to figure out what it is you do want and put your focus on that. Are you following me? This next scripture, it's Mark eleven twenty four. It is the most elegant definition of the law of attraction that I can ever find, and it's in the Bible. You know, it's funny. We put out some advertisements for the class, and some people emailed me, and the class was, this one's called the, the Law of Attraction as Told Through the Scripture. And then I'm doing a workshop this weekend. It's called The Bible and the Law of Attraction. It's an all-day thing. People email me and they said, hey, I got a question about that, uh, the Bible versus the Law of Attraction thing. Verses? <laughs> Verses? <laughs> what? Well, that's not in there. And they're like, oh, it's not? It's what? Because people have this idea or this belief that they contradict and they say different things, but no, they don't. They say the same thing. That's why we're here now having this conversation. And the most elegant definition of law of attraction that I have ever heard or seen is in the Bible. And it's right here, Mark eleven twenty four. 24. So I'm going to dissect this one for a little while. Whatever, what things soever ye desire, when you pray, believe that you have received them and you shall have them. So here's what it says. A lot of cool stuff. Okay, here we go. Whatever, or it says, what things soever ye desire. So here's what it means. What do you want? Seriously, let's take just a second, and I don't need you to say it, but think about what it is that you want. What do you want in your life? What do you want? What's your goal? What is your dream? It says right here, whatever you desire, well, what do you desire? What is your chief aim? You got to know. You can't hit a target that you don't have. Put some thought into that and put some heart into it. What is it that you want? Right off the bat, it doesn't say, what do you want to get rid of? It doesn't say, what do you don't want? Because a lot of times we define ourselves in terms of what we don't want. You've heard me say this before. I want a, a new car. Well, what kind of car do you want? Well, I want one that doesn't suck on gas mileage. And I want one that doesn't have a sunroof because I always forget to close the thing. And I want one that doesn't have two doors. I need four doors. And we, we think 
in our mind that we're being positive or focusing on what we want. But it's this disguised negative focus. It's on what we don't want. So here's the first thing right here. Whatever you desire, figure out what you want. Okay, I'll quit harping on that because that's a whole hour class right there on defining your chief aim and get a burning desire, a desire, a guttural, deep, belly, aching like, connection with it. You get into the, the belief of having it, which that's not the next part. The next part is when you pray. So here's how it goes so far. Whatever you want, figure out what you want. Then it says when you pray, oh, we're, it's going to tell us how to pray. All right, so let's get ready. What, what does it say about prayer? When you pray, believe that you have received that which you're asking for. So the, the words are believe that ye receive them. So that means you have to get into a feeling space. You got to get in the zone. You got to feel it. It can't be just some trivial thought that you have. Oh, yeah, I want that. That'd be cool. People say, I want an income of $10,000 a month. Why? Because I think that'd probably be good. They pay for stuff, probably, I think. You're not going to get it. You won't get it. So one, what was step one? Figure out what you want. Step two, when you pray, all right. So this is about how we pray. Figure out what we want. We bring it to the prayer, and then we believe that we have it. So this is saying act as if we already have it. This is about your feeling. This is about your thinking, and this is about your spoken word. Because if you believe you have something, you're going to act a little differently. You're going to feel a little differently. Right? This is the part where you move your head around. Yeah, 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 yeah. You will. Let's give an example here of maybe what we'll call a negative way to do prayer. So it's not wrong, but it's just not going to get us the outcome or the desire that we want. And I hear this all the time. Oh, Lord, I've been praying and it doesn't seem to be working. The problem has gotten worse. I fear that the devil has taken over Dagon. What? <laughs> Have you read the Bible? Do you understand the word? Do you understand what it's telling you? Because in that example, what you've done is you've prayed the problem. Right off the bat, you say, oh, Lord, I've prayed, but prayer, it doesn't work. Right there, the problem's getting worse. There's the problem. Guess what's going to happen? If you believe the problem is getting worse, what does it say? If you believe it, you'll get it. So what's going to happen? The problem's going to get worse. It's going to get bad. It's going to get real bad. How many people do you know? Because not you, but you know these people. It just seems like it just gets worse and worse and worse. And I'm really trying hard, but it just keeps going in the wrong direction. Yeah, you know those people. If I say, Lord, I'm praying and it's not working, it's not going to work. You're, you're declaring and praying the thing that you don't want. So if you don't want it, don't pray it. Don't say it. Don't think it. Don't feel it. All of these words are interchangeable. I'm using the scripture in the context of the word, the spoken word, but every one of these same things is in there about the heart. And what is in a man's heart is what he brings forth. And so a man thinketh as he is in his heart, and as he is in his heart, he thinketh. And they're all interchangeable. It's really interesting. I'm going to get into this this weekend as well. A lot of times people say mind, body, and spirit. But I flip them, and I, call, and I like to say body, mind, and spirit. Because the mind really is the bridge between the two worlds. We live here in a physical world in the body, but we are spiritual beings from the spirit world, so we got a foot on both sides of the fence. You don't want to be all physical because without any spiritual guidance in your life, well, we, let's not even imagine what that's like. And you don't want to be all spirit because, poof, you wouldn't even be here anymore. You're here for a reason. There's a point to it for you to figure out. And the mind is the way that you do the dance between the two. So mind could be 
thoughts, or it could be heart and feelings, or it could be mouth and words. They all line up there in the middle as the interface between the spirit world and the natural world. Let's talk about natural law for a second. In this example, I'm going to talk about electricity because electricity, even though we don't understand it completely how it works, we know how to harness it and use it for our benefit. And there are some natural laws that govern electricity. If you've ever stuck your finger in the wall socket, you know this. So if we understand, obey, and enforce the law of electricity, then we're able to use it in a way that brings value to our life. It brings benefit. It's good. We like it. It's good stuff. If we go against or break the law, then we have horrible consequences. It's really bad for us. So again, if I, knowing that the law is constant, it doesn't discriminate against anyone. It doesn't care what your religion is. It's electricity. It's going to do whatever it does. So it's my job to align myself with the law of electricity so that I can use it to my benefit instead of to my detriment. You dig? Are you following me? So if I use it the right way, I can turn on the lights, I can take a hot shower, I can wash my clothes, I can cook my food, I can do all of those things that add value to my life. But if I don't have the knowledge of how that works, then I orient myself to the law incorrectly. And it could have a fatal mistake. I get burned or electrocuted or or killed. I mean, imagine if there was a downed power line and maybe it's been that way for a day and you think that the line isn't live anymore and it's a dead line and your ball gets kicked over there so you trot it. This is me trotting over. You trot over to go get your ball and you say, oh, there's a power line there but it's not on but I'm still going to play it safe. I'm going to just, I'm not going to touch it. I'll be careful not to bump it or anything. And you go over to get the ball. But if you don't know how electricity works and that line is still live, that electrical field, that electromagnetic field and the current generated from that wire will arc across the air and zap you. And it'll be a fatal mistake. And you won't get up from it. And it's all from you not having the knowledge It's all from you not understanding the law and how to correctly use it or for you to interface with it or how to orient yourself with the law. So the spiritual law is the same way. It's about you knowing and understanding so that you can align yourself with it. It's about you understanding the simple point that I've made that when the word is in your heart, and what people may say is the Holy Spirit has filled your heart, then you're able to use your tongue to transform that with your spoken word to release God's ability within you. You unleash a spiritual force. That's just awesome. That gives me goosebumps. That's the power that you have. So if you get anything out of tonight, I want you to get this, okay? Ready? (laughs) The spirit world is ruled by the word of God. The natural world is to be controlled by man speaking God's word. I'm going to say it again. The spirit world is controlled by the word of God. The natural world is to be controlled by man speaking God's word. So in that respect, God's spoken word is creative power. Ooh. God's spoken word is creative power, and you get to pick which words that you speak. So by that definition, you are a creator. And you're not the creator, I'm not saying that we're all God or something, but we are co-creators and we have an influence on the outcome. With our mind and our intention, we guide the expression of our life. Get this, God created you and you create your life. You're responsible for all of it. All of the good and all of the bad and everything in between. It's your creation, it's your doing. 
And it all has taken place because of the way that you've chosen to align yourself with the Word. That's all. And if you didn't know, just like maybe the person didn't know about the law of electricity and got too close to the power line and got zapped, maybe you've spiritually gotten zapped. Luckily, you're not out of the game. I'm sure you've all been zapped before. I got zapped good when that woman put those papers on my desk. That story I told you at the beginning. Zapparama, you talk about intense emotional override shutdown. Just crumpled up in my chair. I wanted to cry. I thought, dear Lord, what, what's going on? What am I doing? But it strengthened my resolve. Are we having fun yet? Yeah? Okay. Just checking. All right, that was the first page. Nine more to go. No, I'm just kidding. We're not going to get through all this tonight. Uh, I'm going to go for another 15 minutes or so. There's so many things I want to share with you. But if you get anything tonight, it's the idea that you are a creative being and that your choosing of your words and your thoughts is releasing an amazing spiritual power. It is releasing the ability of God within you. So here, this is fun. I'm going to have to read this one. John 16, verse 23 through 24, says, Jesus said, And in that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall ask in my Father's name, he will give it to you. Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. Ask, and what? You shall receive. Ask, and you shall receive, that your joy may be full. Ask, and you shall receive, that your joy may be full. So ask in the Father's name. That means align yourself with the word so that as it comes out, it's faith-filled words that you're speaking for what you desire. It's not bad to desire things. All right, prayer is meant to deliver to you the things in your life that you need and you desire. In that moment, when you speak those words that overflow from your heart, you call God onto the scene in your behalf to show up and to, to do your will. Prayer is a good thing. Getting stuff is not bad. It is a good thing. Here's what I hear a lot of people in the kind of law of attraction world. They say, that law of attraction stuff seems like really selfish. Because law of attraction people are always talking about new cars and boats and houses and stuff like that. They say, that's a selfish manipulation. Because it's not my will that's important. It's God's will. I serve God's will. And when something good happens, they say, you didn't do that. God did that. That wasn't you. Don't try to take credit for it. All the glory above. Thank God. Okay, yes, thank God. I'm not saying don't thank God. Don't misinterpret that at all. Here's a, here's a verse I'm just going to read, and then you tell me what you think. This is John 15, verse 7 and 8. If ye abide in me, and my word abides in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. You, do you notice that when, you, when your prayer is answered, it glorifies God? That when you get what you want and your needs are met, that it glorifies the Father? That it says, herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit? So you could think of bear much fruit as whatever your dream or desire or goal is. It's the thing that you are praying to. And when you get it, it glorifies God. So you're happy. You speak the word. You get what you want. God's happy. Everybody's happy. <laughs> and I say it, you know, almost jokingly, but it is what is written in the scripture. This is the word. So I keep saying the word and the word of God. It's this. It's the Bible. Or whatever scriptural teaching that you use, 
We'll find it in there. The truth is the truth. One of, one of the concepts I really love in the Jewish faith is something called a mezuzah. It's a scroll they put over the door frame, and it has a text in it. But it basically mean, means to bring you in remembrance of, so that every time you walk through the door, you think of God, and you think of that spirit that lives inside of you, and you align yourself with that so that as you show up to your life and play the game, you show up in a version of who you are that is in greater alignment with the way original design meant for you to be. Instead of the version that we make here in our head using our conscious mind to judge all the things around us as being right or wrong or good or bad, to get stuck in old programs from negative junk that's taken place in our life so that we aren't free to be connected and to express our potential. That's just cool, isn't it? Prayer is a good thing. I skipped over this one here, so I just want to go back because I got excited and I jumped ahead. I mentioned that prayer is kind of your legal right to call God on the scene and say, hey, here's what I want. Boom, ask and you shall receive. It's done. You guys, I'm sure you're jiving with the law of attraction message that's in here, right? I'm just trying to use the scripture. I'm just trying to use the Bible in the way that it says to arm you with the certainty so that you can go out and do the same thing. Because in order for you to do this, you have to transform. You have to know it. It has to be a part of you. And you do that through repetition. You do it over and over until it's in the knowledge bank and it's a part of you so that you don't have to think about it. It's just there. It's the thing that I call unconscious competence. You've just hit it so many times it's a part of you. So this is Luke chapter 6, verse 45. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Ooh. How many people do you hang around that show what their heart is full of by the words they pick and where their focus is at and what they speak. The problem, the problem, the problem, the problem. They're addicted to it, aren't they? I, and I'm not free from it, you know. There's no halo around me. Do the same thing. But that's just part of being human. You know, we are going to sin, we're going to screw up, we're going to fall and bump our head. But it's not about you feeling horrible about it. It's not about me using that as leverage to create horrible, negative, guilty emotions in you to get you to do what I think you should do, like that woman did with her daughter, because she believed something and wanted everyone else in her life to act accordance to what she believed. Here's what judgment is. If I have an umbrella, it's over my head, if you believe what I believe and you're here under my umbrella with me, you're cool. But if you believe something that's too far away from, the, from where my umbrella is and now you're out there, you're wrong. That's judgment. Here's the funny thing. It's, a, it's easy to understand that it's, we shouldn't be judging people out there as being wrong, but it's just as bad when they're in here with us and we say they're right. We do it all the time. You know, you're in the room and you're like, oh, the room's too hot. Judgment. Or the room's too cold. Judgment. And I'll just give you a little nugget here, okay, because we're not going to get into this too deeply tonight. If you look at somebody else and you make a decision about them or a situation, that's judgment. But if you just make a decision about yourself, you're not doing judgment, and you're free from that. So if I see the guy walking around Walmart, and his pants are like down here <laughs> near his knees, and he has to walk with his feet really wide so they don't fall down, I see him all the time. I want to tap him on the shoulder and be like, I can see your underwear. Is that part of the designer look or something? But right in that moment, 
as I make a joke about it, I'm doing judgment. I'm, I'm not aligning with the word. I'm putting distance and separation between me and the power that built me. But if I look at that same guy walking through Walmart and I say, look at those pants. I would choose to never do that. In fact, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go ahead and tighten my belt one more notch, just, just in case. Then I've made a decision about me and what I'm going to do, not about other people and what, whether they're doing is right or wrong. So we're going to kind of, I, I want to hit this part. So I'll just hit it with you because it's about prayer. And I want you to understand that faith makes prayer work. It doesn't go the other way around. Prayer doesn't make faith work. You can sit around and pray all you want. But if you don't have the faith and confidence and belief in what you stand for, it's not going to work. It's just lip service. It's blah, blah, blah. You have to have the heart behind it. You have to believe it. And you'll get it and you'll receive. What does the Bible say about prayer? Whatever you desire, when you pray, believe that you have received that which you're asking, and you shall have it. So here's another take on prayer. And this is the way that I see it. This isn't what's in the Bible. This is Dr. Ted's opinion being inserted right here. Prayer is a way for us at the end of the day to recount or recourse the events that took place so that we can be thankful for every single person and situation and event that took place during that day. Everyone. I never met a man I didn't like because they all had something to teach me. I think Oral Roberts said that. I'm not sure. Don't quote me on that quote. Rogers. Rogers. Oral Rogers. Will Rogers. Thank you. Yeah. You came through for me. Will Rogers is the one who said that. If you think back on the events of your day and there's a negative experience, I want you to understand that there is nothing negative that happens. It's only your judgment of it. That if... God is the creator of everything and he is perfect and we are built in the image of perfection, then there is no imperfection. God can only make more perfection. So the negativity exists in our mind. We create those negative thoughts. We frame it that way. So we have the ability to reframe it and to see the good, to learn the lesson, to understand why that was a good thing, why I'm glad it happened. Here's why I'm better. Here's what it forced me to do. This is what activated inside of me and came online to show up to me in the way that I live my life that would have never happened before if that, quote, bad thing had never happened. Life doesn't happen to you. Life happens for you so that you can learn. And there are lessons everywhere. You just got to find the gold. You know the old adage that when you look for gold, you have to move tons of dirt. But you're not looking for dirt. You're looking for gold. How many people do you know that are the gold lookers? Everywhere they go, this is great. This is so wonderful. This is amazing. And the other people are like, can't believe this. This stinks. Oh, it's gold. Oh, can you believe the prices? Oh, my goodness. You know the people. You're probably related to some of them. Prayer is a way for you, before you go to bed, to reframe and recap your day so that you don't put negative experiences that have negative values assigned to them, so you don't put that on the hard drive and stick it in the permanent memory bank before you go to sleep. Because when you go to bed, it all goes on the hard drive. And if you put it on the hard drive and you don't like it, now you have to come see me and get on the table (laughs) so that we can work with you to update those old beliefs and those old programs. This really is the way, this way of using prayer is how you dodge doing forgiveness. This is how you circumvent forgiveness. Because you don't ever have to forgive something unless you judge it wrong in the first place, unless you judge it. 
You don't have to forgive anything that you haven't first judged. So if before you go to bed, you can look through all the little judgments that you've made throughout the day and reframe them, you're good. And you're not going to damage your alignment with Original design with the creator, with God, with the word, with the power. You dig that? So this is a good place to kind of shift. There's so many more things I want to go through with you. But what I promised that I wanted to do with you was to help begin, make a transformation so that you not only have the certainty that you can speak these things, but you can begin to line up with them yourself because when you line up, you don't have any more hands to hold all of your baggage anymore. Does that make sense? All of the clutter and the junk that you continuously carry around like a backpack full of rocks walking up a mountain, when you align yourself with that power, those things resolve. They dissolve. They fade away. And you become more in close connection with the very power and perfection that you were built in the image of. That's what happens. I'm telling you that when you know this stuff and you know that you know it, a home run. It's just part of you and you don't have to think because you're thought through. You notice how many times I said the same thing tonight over and over and I said it kind of from a little different way. It's because the way your brain works you have to have repetition. You need spaced repetition. And you have to hear it, and then you have to hear it again, and you have to hear it again, and you have to hear it again. So I have a recorder on right now. I am going to put this class up on the Meetup website for the next 48 hours. And you can listen to it again if you want. It will be on YouTube, really. I don't, I haven't, don't have it up yet, so I don't have a link to give you. But I'll email it to you through the Meetup site. And you can listen to it for the next 48 hours because you're going to hear things in there that you didn't hear tonight. It's so powerful for you to be able to re-listen to things. So I said I was going to give you a handout. Do, do we have that handout, Deborah? Mm-hmm. Will you please uh, pass it out for me? Okay. Thank you very, very much. It's got all of the scripture and all the verses on there. And it has on there what we're going to go over this weekend in our workshop. And I put the points on here so you know where it is that you need to go if you want to get the result or the outcome that I promised you. It's not rocket surgery. That was a joke. (laughs) Wah, wah. It's not a crazy rocket science. It's just something you have to do. You have to do it. So the scripture is on there, and the points that we're going to go over are there as well. So I actually have a very good friend coming into town. He lives in Fort Worth, Texas. He attended a Bible college. He went into ministry. He studied, or he, he did mission work in the Slavic Republic for know, four years, six years, something. He'll tell you. This is a guy that wanted to go into ministry. He knows the Bible. And his quest led him to understanding how the mind works and ultimately how the law of attraction works. I came at it from the other way. I came at it from understanding the mind and how it related to health to begin seeing the theme in the scriptures to now talking about the Bible. Who would have ever thought that I'd be here doing a class about the Bible? Not me. So you get both of these angles coming at this topic and this subject. One of the things that's not on here, which I kind of you know, had a brain fart when I looked back at it, but it's fine, is about the role that the church plays, the role that religion plays, and how we use it all incorrectly. We all do. Really what it's there for, what it's meant to do, and what it's meant to be. And I don't care what your religion or church is. There's just some key elements that you have to know. You have to have the knowledge so that you can line up with it. So the high points are on here. 
And I kind of touched on this first one a little bit, how our mind is able to unite or divide the body and the spirit. There's a battle that goes on between the spirit and the body. And the tongue is the battleground. There's scripture that says the tongue can't be tamed. So people say, well, it doesn't matter. Why would we even try? Well, it says man can't tame the tongue, but the Holy Spirit can do that. And so when the spirit is able to speak with faith-filled words, the tongue is tamed. The spirit can tame the tongue. And the scripture says that any man that speaks the word of the spirit will never have any trouble controlling the body. This is laid out right here in our quest for health. It's written right there in the scripture. These next parts are going to be what Charles, Charles Robertson is the gentleman's name who will be here. This is what he's going to go through, putting on the mind of Christ so that we begin to live in the kingdom of heaven. You guys are going to love him. If you think I'm cool, this guy is amazing. I'm so, so cool. This guy is totes my goats. He's awesome. Don't ever say that again. <laughs> totes my goats. And then here's really where he's going to shine. He's going to use the parables to tell a deeper meaning of what Jesus was really up to. Because here's the, here's the rub. The things that you may have learned or know about it, they're true. So we're never saying that it's not true. We're saying, yes, and there's more. Yes, and let's go deeper. See, it's not either or, it's both and. So I want to make sure that you do this. You say, yeah, and, instead of yeah, but. Don't yeah, but me this weekend. <laughs> just keep an open mind. And he's just going to rock you. I wish that I could convey what it is that he's going to share with you. But I just can't do it. I can't do it. And it's going to be a perfect marriage of us coming from different angles to bring you the outcome to bring you the ability to have the certainty so that you not only can inspire people, so that you not only can talk about this with certainty and share in their language and meet them where they are, but so that you can begin to align with it, so that you can get rid of your baggage and do the work on yourself. Really? Nobody ever needs to come here and get on the table and get a treatment. You can do the stuff on your own. I just help you do it faster. That's all. A whole lot faster. Okay, just a couple things and then we're done for our evening. Uh, a few people that I talked to about the class this weekend, because the, the order form is at the bottom there. So you can see how to do it. If you want to come and join us, great. If you want to do it on your own, all of the things are there. All of the steps are there. Somebody said, I can't be here. So guess what? I'm going to record the whole thing. And you'll be able to experience it just like you were sitting in the room. So that's not a challenge. The recordings will be the cost of the seminar. It wouldn't be fair to give, give somebody a different price on it and you pay full price to come to the thing. So the, the fee of the class is $99. It's all day Saturday from 9 to 4. We will eat lunch. And we might go longer, too. Where is it again? It'll be right here in this room. Nine to four. $99. You can buy the audios. Some people said, 99 bucks. Eh. Okay. So I have a specific person in mind that approached me with that. I said, if you want to, you can break it into two payments. So I put them down on there. You pay 57 bucks now, and then you pay 57 bucks in a month. So that actually turns out to be more than 99, but that's how those things work. Okay? <laughs> what I want to do as a gift to you, that if you want to do this, if you know you want to, if it just speaks to you and you're ready to do it and you want to go to the next step, then I want to reward you. And if you turn your order form in tonight, I'm going to give you the audios of the class so that you'll be able to have them. And I want to emphasize how important it is to have those things because of the way that you learn information, you have to do it over and over at the conscious competence level until it gets into the knowledge bank. 
You have to do it over and over. And being able to listen back to an experience is so very powerful. So that's why we're going to record it. And that's why we're going to do it. That's, what, that's why I'm doing it. So that you have the ability to not just hear it once and then go, that was great, and go on about your life. As we end tonight, I just want you to know one thing. And I said it already tonight, that the spirit world is controlled by the word of God and that the natural world is controlled by man's spoken word. So when we speak the word of God, we release a creative spiritual power and we call God on the scene in our behalf. And that's your right. So make sure that you stand up and own it. You take that right and you you live it and you stand firm and you be proud and you figure out what it is that you desire and believe that you have it. That's all. Welcome, everybody.